kids, but we're so glad that you came because this, this was the highlight of my day is to see our children lead us in worship. You know, it, it, it embodies the very heart of my message, which is the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. That is, that is what we saw here this morning, is the light of Christ shining brilliantly in the hearts of our children, leading us to worship, telling us the story of the gospel in their lives. This is something that is the gospel, actually. It's, it's human beings telling the story of Jesus. And uh, it's going to be told so well as we go through this gospel. Uh, where we are is we're, we're, we've just launched the gospel of John. And we're going to go straight through it. It's going to take us a while. We began last week with just the first three verses. But the whole part of, of the opening of John is called his prologue. And it gives you an idea of what's going to happen throughout the entire gospel. And it begins with just a celebration of who Jesus was. Last week we looked at the Jewish and the Greek context for the gospel of John. For 600 years before Christ... Uh, Greek philosophers like Heraclitus and Zeno and Plato and Philo all intuited through the light that was given to them by God that the only way to make sense of the world was the reason of God, the logos of God. So, So this concept of logos was 600 years old before Christ was even born. And then John speaks into it. In the beginning was the? The logos. In the beginning was the Logos, the Word, the reason of God. And the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were made through him, and not one thing was made without him. This was the opening prologue, the first three verses we looked at last week. So today we're going to continue on, beginning with verse 4, and we'll go all the way to verse 13. I'll try. So, if you would, please stand for the reading of God's Word. This is part of our tradition in our church to just stand out of reverence as we read the passage for the day. So, let us continue reading, beginning with verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, He gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Thank you. Please be seated. Church, would you pray with me? Lord, as we gather around the gospel again this morning, I pray that your Holy Spirit would fill this place. We thank you for the the heartfelt worship of our children who led us this morning. Lord, we acknowledge the darkness. It is there and it is real. And many of us have struggled this week. But here within the gospel, we find a declaration that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. May that be our testimony as we leave here today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, my message this morning will fall under three subheadings. Shocker. Uh, Number one, the new creation Number two, a point of clarification. And number three, the invitation. The creation, a point of clarification, the invitation. Number one, the new creation. Um, If you think about the prologue so far, John has begun, you know, at 50,000 feet, and he's pointing all the way back. Literally, the first three words of the Gospel of John are, in the beginning. It takes us right back, even before the creation, before anything was made in the beginning, was the Word, and the Word was God, and was with God, and so on. And then we're going to move into the present tense. We're going to move into what Christ is doing, and what he has done, and and we're going to end in the present tense. And so there's going to be a bit of a bridge here that's going to happen. It's going to happen, in my opinion, (laughs) uh, through this word, light. 
So what we're going to do, I'm going to take you on a little exercise. We're going to go all the way back to Genesis 1, and I want you to listen to the imagery of light that is found in the creation story. I think there's just something interesting here. So let's just read this. Uh, I'll put the words up on the screen. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. Now, we're going to skip. After God separates the heavens from the earth, the land from the sea, creates all the fruits and vegetables and trees, we're going to come to day four. And here's what we'll read, beginning with verse 14. Now listen. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. Now, what did you hear? I mean, I've read the creation story a thousand times, and I've always, I don't know about you, but when you get to Genesis 1-3, and the very first words we ever hear from God, and God said, let there be light, immediately what comes to mind is what? The sun, right? That God creates the sun. Boom, you know, and then of course this big bang, or, you know, I don't, I just think, you know, that's the way a lot of people see this they, in their minds. But then I always get a little bit confused because you get down to day four and he, there is where he makes the sun and the moon. So God said, let there be light on day one, the very first thing he ever says. And then in day four, he creates the sun and the moon. Now, listen again to this concept of creation through John's prologue. Listen for the word light. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was God in the beginning. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. In my opinion, these verses actually address the mystery of the light that Father declares in Genesis 1 3. According to John, the word, the Logos, was in the beginning. All things were made through him. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. In him was the light. What if when God first speaks in Genesis 1-3, and he says, let there be light, he doesn't create a son. He invokes the son, his son. You know, in the book of Revelation 21, verse 23, there's a, there's a descriptor of the next age the new heavens and the new earth, and there will be no sun, moon, or stars, for the light will come from the glory of God through the Lamb, who is the lamp. What if the pre-created reality was that just the glory of Jesus the Word created light upon this cold rock and brought light to the universe, and it was later that the sun and the moons were put in place. It's a very powerful picture because it says at the very beginning, Jesus was always the light. The light of the universe, the light of the cosmos, the light of men. The life was in him. I just think this picture is going to be so consistent and so powerful all throughout the Gospel of John. That it was always this way. At the beginning. And the light still shines in the darkness. We're going to come to that in just a minute. Now, there's two words. There's so many titles that Jesus is given here. The Word, God, He is the life, the light. All of these titles are given to Him here in the prologue. But let us take a moment and, 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 and come back to the life. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. It's going to be time now for the geek with the Greek. All right, this is going to be just kind of an ongoing thing. I'm going to like try to have a little jingle or something. All right, because we're going to look at the Greek all throughout this. When you do expository preaching, that gives you the opportunity to geek out. This is so important, though. There's really three words for life in the Greek, and these are, these are significant. Number one is the word bios. This is the physical life. <clears throat> this is where we get our term biology, right? Number two is psuche. Can you say psuche? You have to put a P and S together. It's challenging. Psuche. 
All right, psuche. Psuche is the life of the human soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions. All right, and then finally is zoe. And zoe, for the Greeks, could just mean life in general or just all of life. But for the Christians, they hijacked that word, as they would tend to do, and it, it represented the eternal life, the uncreated life of God. Okay, so biosuke zoe. When you go back to the beginning and you look at creation, we see all three forms. Bios is the life that God gives to the planet Earth, in the animals, in the plants, all the things that are created, he gives bios, life. By the way, we'd have no idea how life ever comes into existence apart from God making it happen, right? But then even more so is this moment where as he creates man out of the dust, he has bios, but then something else happens. God breathes into him spirit. This is the suke. This is his mind, his will, his emotions. This is where we bear the image of God, right? This is what sets human beings apart from the animals and the trees and everything else that has life. It's the suke. But there in the garden was also the zoe. Where was it? Do you remember? It was the tree of life, the tree of zoe, the eternal uncreated life of God that was accessible for created man. You see, in the beginning, we were intended to live perfectly, perfectly in relationship to the creation, perfectly in relationship to one another, perfectly in relationship to God, and perfectly forever through the Zoe life. But then what happened? Well, we know what happened. You, you look in Genesis 3, and we fell. We sinned against God. And the result was a curse, the curse of sin. And we were, we were no longer able to dwell within the garden, have access to the Zoe. Because sinful people cannot access the Zoe, the life of God, the eternal life. That is the picture of the creation and of life. Now keep that in mind when we come back to what John writes, in him was Zoe. And the Zoe was the light of men. John is pointing back to the beginning and he's setting us up. He's saying, in Jesus the Logos, in the beginning was Zoe, the eternal life, the uncreated life of God. He was the active agent in all creation. Nothing was made apart from him. That Zoe was in the Logos in the beginning, and then we get to John 5, I mean 1, 5, and he's going to switch tenses. He's going to point back to the beginning, to the original creation, to the life, to the light that was in Christ. He's going to come, he's going to bring it into present tense. He's preparing us to understand that this was the creation And now as the light returns, as he comes, as he makes himself manifest in a way that nobody expected, he is inaugurating the new creation. And he he just hints to it. All of this is going to be unpacked throughout the whole gospel. But he hints to it as he moves from the past tense. In him was life, which was the light of men. And he gets to verse 5 and he says, And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Do you hear the switch in tense? From past tense to right now. And this past tense of the light and the life and the word who was God and with God and all things created through him is suddenly right now in your living room in the first century, in the 21st century. That light still shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. In the world of Greek philosophy, in Gnosticism, and on so many of the ancient mystical cults of religion, the assumption was the darkness is winning. This is why the Gnostics believed that all of the world was dark, all of matter was evil. It just looked that way. It kind of still looks that way, doesn't it? A lot of times when you watch the news, when we read the paper, when we see what's going on in the world and all the pain and all the suffering, it looks like the darkness is winning, the darkness is stronger. This was prevalent within the worldview. And John says, the light still shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. It is a powerful moment. He who was in the beginning, who was with God, who was God, who was the light that lit up the universe. He's not dead. He's very much alive. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness is not overcome. At church, are you hurting? Are you anxious? 
Are you fearful? Raise up your heads. The gospel is clear. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Do you believe that? If you believe that, then let us not walk around as those racked with worry and fear and anxiety as though the darkness wins. The darkness doesn't win. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Take heart. The whole world needs to hear John 1, 5. The whole world needs to more than hear it. They need to see it. They need to see it in those who Christ now resides as the Zoe, as the light of men. That is why our mission statement is to be the light of Christ in a hurting culture because the light still shines in the darkness and the darkness does not overcome it. We're gonna move on in just a minute to my second point, but first, let us return to the geek with the Greek for just a second, all right? Many of you grew up reading the New International Version of the Bible or the King James Version. How many of you are aware of the New International, the King James Version? This is kind of what you grew up with. A lot of us grew up with those translations. So <clears throat> the NIV reads, this verse five says, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not understood it. If you're used to the King Jimmy, it reads, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not, right? So, well, what is it? Understood or overcome? Overcome sounds very dramatic. Understood sounds intellectual. It, yes. All right, let's, let's geek out for a minute. The verb is katalambano. Can you say katalambano? Now you can tell all your friends you speak Greek, all right? Katalambano. The normal context of this verb means to lay hold of, to grasp, okay, to lay hold of. All right, so in an intellectual sense, this would be to grasp a concept or to seize upon an idea, katalambano. That would be uh, to understand or comprehend, right? But where there is a contest, where there's this contest, a, a conflict of cosmic dark and light, where there's a battle, katalambano would indicate one who wins over the other. It would be like saying, I owned you in that bike race, or I snatched the victory from its grasp. Such is why it would be appropriate in this context to say the darkness did not overcome it, overtake it, eclipse it, obliterate it, or destroy it. Try as it might. Try as it might, the darkness could not win a victory over the light. This is uh, Leon Morris, a New Testament scholar, weighs down on this. He says, we do not usually talk of darkness as trying to understand light. To take this meaning is really to think of darkness as equivalent to certain people or perhaps the human race at large. But in this gospel, darkness is not so much people as the evil environment in which people find themselves. The theme of the perpetual conflict between light and darkness is found throughout the book. The verb katalambano we are discussing here has a rare but sufficiently attested meaning overcome. It is that that is required here. The light is shining in the darkness. The darkness was, not, was unable to overcome the light. Some authors discern a reference to the fall. Perhaps more likely, it's a reference to Calvary. There the light and the darkness came into better and decisive conflict and the darkness could not prevail. Now here's what he concludes with and I really want you to watch for this as we go through the gospel. He says, probably in his usual manner, John is using an expression that should be taken as true on more than one level. <clears throat> I think that's a really good point. John is brilliant and he's filled with the Holy Spirit as he's writing this and so it is absolutely both. The light shines in the darkness, Period. And the darkness has both not understood it and not overcome it. And so both translations are a very reasonable translation and both meetings are very sufficient. All right, number two, a point of clarification. Uh, how many of you, when you've been reading the first chapter of John, if you've ever read the first chapter of John, you know you have all this powerful imagery of the word and words with God and was God and he was life and light of men and all of that. The light shines in the darkness, darkness not overcome it. And there was a man sent from God, his name was John. It's like, <laughs> in fact, I mean, a lot of times, like if I'm reading that, like in a funeral setting or something, I just skip over this little passage just because you literally, and the light shines in the darkness and the true light was coming into the world, right? I mean, it feels like it flows, but there's this interruption that begins there in verse six. Uh, and it's just weird. There's this, all of a sudden we're talking about John the Baptist, right? Now remember, I, I set this up a little bit in the first sermon of this series because the context that John the Apostle is writing his gospel, he's in the city of Ephesus. He's been there for probably 50 years. 
there's 50 years of church history, and one of the problems, and it's really prevalent, I think, in Ephesus, is that people have a very elevated view of John the Baptist, sometimes even replacing Jesus with John the Baptist. Let me just give you a few examples, go back to our our journey through Acts, if you remember this. Uh, There was, uh, well, Acts 19, one through three. And it happened that while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples, and he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we've we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. Earlier in Acts 18, remember Apollos, the great orator, uh, loved to teach, and he was very gifted at teaching, but when he's in Ephesus, it becomes apparent that he only knows of John's baptism, and so Priscilla and Quilla, you know, bring him up to speak. All right, so in Ephesus, there was a real issue with people being confused about who John the Baptist was. Now, if you notice, in John's gospel, he says, in the beginning was the word. And he was, in him was the life, and the life was a lot of men. But he's not mentioned the word Jesus yet. And so just, he just calls a timeout and says, uh, I'm not talking about John the Baptist, in case you're wondering. So here, here's what he writes. Just interrupts his whole flow of thought in verse 6, and he says, Uh, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. Now, there's one thing you have to give John is that he's pretty clear. And, you know, in these days, I'm I'm really appreciate people who can write with clarity so as not to be confused or misunderstood. You know what I'm talking about? So here, John the apostle could not be more clear. John was sent by God. Jesus is God. John came to bear witness about the light. Jesus is the light. John was not the light. Jesus is the light that John came to bear witness to. Three times he uses the word witness for John. Now, this is not belittling John the Baptist at all. In fact, it's elevating John the Baptist in the appropriate way because there are predictions in the Old Testament that there will be one who comes to prepare a way for the Lord. This is John the Baptist, and he calls people to repentance and he is the witness. Very important concept. We'll see this throughout uh, the Gospel of John. New Testament scholar John Stott writes, this is the first occurrence of one of the key themes of this Gospel, bearing witness. John the Baptist is particularly identified with this activity, but listen, there are seven others who testify to the truth of God's self-disclosure in the Word made flesh. The Father, the Son himself, the Holy Spirit, the works of Jesus, the Scriptures, assorted human witnesses, and finally the evangelist himself. So we can look for this theme of bearing witness because this, Stott says, in John's society, witness bearing was a serious matter and was the means of establishing the truth. How many of you know that's still the means of establishing the truth, right? In a court of law, nothing is as powerful as an eyewitness. So John was set apart to be the witness. And this is a hugely important thing. We'll track it all through the Gospel of John. But is anybody unclear about who the John Baptist was and who he was and who he was not? No, we have absolute clarity, thanks to the gospel here, just making a point of clarification. And now we'll move to the third point, an invitation. And it's literally, we now resume our regular schedule program. We're going to pick up right where we left off uh, with verse 5 and, and start right back with verse 9. The true light, says John, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He just said, you know, Jesus is the light, not John the Baptist, right? The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, so we're finishing out this picture of who he was in the beginning, and now that he came, what happened? All right, but first, let's stick with those, just the first couple words. The true light which gives light to everyone. This is really an important concept. In the Christian mindset, we acknowledge that there's only one light. Jesus, the Logos of God, is the light, the light of men. And he is the one who gives light to everyone. In the world, there's such a... uh, uh, 
if you really are a geeky intellectual person, there is a ton written in, in the world of epistemology. Okay, how do we know that we know? How do we learn? What evidence of the divine is this within words and language and reason and learning? And one of the key points of the Christian intellectual is to say, we know nothing apart from the light, which is the Logos. There is no such thing as learning apart from him. This is a central claim of the Christian intellectual. The light of all people comes from the Logos, the reason, the word of God. And apart from him, we would know nothing. We would have no light. So it's, it's a funny thing. We use the tools of God to try to disprove God. That's one of the key arguments, right? Where do, where, how can we account for reason and rational thought and learning and language in, in a cold universe of impersonal substance plus time and chance? It's impossible. The Logos is the light for all men. And so last week we saw great Greek philosophers 600 years before Christ, Heraclitus, right? Zeno, Plato, Philo, the list goes on of people who with the light of common grace given to them could surmise that the only reasonable explanation was the Logos. But their light was incomplete. They would only reason that the Logos had to be, but it was unknowable, impersonal. And so the light was not sufficient, but there was some light, and that's why we would expect to see the light of reason and, and common grace amongst people of all walks of life, people you know, of all different religions and tribes and tongues and language, and we'd see that everywhere in the world. It's accounted for right here, the true light which gives light to everyone. Now, sometimes we see this true light in people of all different religions and all different walks of life and say, universal salvation, everyone should be saved, everyone has, everyone's a child of God. But that is not consistent with the gospel. In fact, if we do not come into relationship with the light himself and have a personal relationship with him, even what little light that we have can become darkness. Uh, Charles Spurgeon once wrote, the darkness will not overcome the light. It never has done so, it never will. You may sometimes call the darkness the ignorance of men or the sin of men, if you like. You may call it the wisdom of men and the righteousness of men, for that is only another form of the same darkness. Do you see his point? Our greatest wisdom, our greatest morality, our greatest righteousness that we can drum up within ourselves, in the end, will result only in darkness. There's only one true light, and, and he's personal, and he has come into the world that he would fully enlighten and restore the new creation, right? So, now, the next verse says, uh, the light came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. I mean, there's no doubt that his own people are referring to the sons of Abraham, the nation of Israel. These are his people, the people of his father. Leon Morris really captures this beautifully, just the lament that's in this verse. Morris writes, the word did not go where he could not have expected to be known. He came home. Where the people should have known him, and it was the home folk, his own, who did not receive him. This brings the rejectors into special relation with the rejected. They should have known better. This is going to be a common theme all throughout the Gospel of John, particularly when we get to, to John 8. You can cut this tension with a knife. But it's all throughout all of the Gospels. I, I mean, the painful lament here reflects the disillusionment of being rejected by one's own family. Imagine, if you will, the father who comes home to his family after many years of fighting in the war only to discover that no one recognizes him. There are no hugs, no kisses, no banners, no singing, no dancing, just locked doors and looks of indifference. Such is the tragedy of the human condition. The playwright stepped onto the stage and the players knew him not. It is a lament, and it is, it's in the gospel, it's in history. That's not to say that none of the Jews accepted Jesus, none of them received him. Obviously, the disciples did. There were some that did. But John, after 50 years of reflection, looking at the spread of the early church all throughout the ancient world, is making the same observation that the apostle Paul made in Romans 11, that there has been a partial hardening that has come upon all of Israel. But the rejection of those who should have known better is not the end of the story. 
And it's probably one of the main reasons that John finally wrote his gospel. John insists that the light still shines in the darkness. The darkness did not snuff it out. And hope returns in verse 12 when John writes, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Here John turns his attention back to the Gentiles, back to his Greek neighbors, back to all the people who were never included as the people of God. These are, these are all the people who are outside of the special revelation of God and the circumcised people of Israel. He says, the family of God, because of the Logos, is not limited to the circumcised of the flesh, but the word has come for all who will receive him. Like the Apostle Paul, John will come to understand that the children of Abraham are not identified by blood, but by those who love Jesus. John begins his gospel then with the same, with the same purpose as he ends it. These are the bookends of the gospel right here, and it is an invitation. Right here at the very beginning of the gospel, there is an invitation to the reader, to the listener. All those who would receive him and believe upon his name, regardless of anything that's happened in your life, regardless of heritage, station, lineage, any external factor, if the reader will simply believe in his name and receive him, the logos, the light, a transaction is going to happen. And it is remarkable that this believer will be given the right to become a child of God. He will be adopted into God's family. And it won't be because of their good works or their righteousness. It won't be due to their family or the bloodline of their royal lineage. Their adoption into God's family will be solely attributable to a rebirth. A rebirth in the spirit. Uh, the old is gone the new has come, a new creation, born into God's family. This is something Paul unpacks in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, of the old is gone, the new has come, there's a new creation. This invitation will be all throughout the Gospel of John, and it'll finish as we get to the end of John when he concludes 2031. These things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by leaving by believing you may have life in his name. Church, listen. Jesus is going to do this. John just did it. It's going to happen over and over again. He's going to present all of reality in terms of people into two groups of people. There are going to be those who reject the word and the light. And they remain outside of God's family. They are lost. They are spiritual orphans. Darkness is their destiny apart from God. The light has come into the world that we might believe him and receive him, that we might be forgiven and adopted into God's family. I mean, it, it is my job to ask you, where are you? The gospel is not to be preached to be found interesting. It is not to be taught to stimulate our intellect to say, I really appreciated that, all that information about the Greek philosophers. It's an invitation. It's an invitation to enter into God's family that you might be forgiven, that you might have the Zoe of God in you, that the light of Christ would be in you, that it would transform you, that there would be a rebirth, that the dead, the old would be gone, and the new would come. And this invitation is for the whole world. It is the most inclusive invitation, period. I, I weary of our critics saying that we're so exclusive. Every other religion is exclusive. You have to follow a certain number of rules. You have to be born of a certain blood. Christianity says all people, regardless of bloodline, socioeconomic background, all the horrible mess that you've been a part of your whole life, if you would simply repent and receive the Logos, the light who is at the beginning and the light still shines in the darkness and he's 
unmistakably still alive in the center of all of history if you would simply yield and just receive him and believe in the name above all names, you will be adopted into God's family. The Zoe will be within you and you will shine as the light of Christ in this dark and hurting culture. So I invite you. I invite you right now to receive him who came into the world as the light. He is the life, the Zoe that your heart has always longed for. He is the path home to the Father. And if you will repent and place your faith in him, you will be born again. And if you are those in whom the light shines now, Please make it your mission in life to invite and share the invitation with a hurting culture. They don't know. It looks like the darkness is one. People are ending their lives at record numbers. They are in a place of despair. They need to know. The light still shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Amen? Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you so much for this powerful testimony the witness of the gospel, and it is true. We know in our hearts it's true. So many of us fear of what it would cost us if we were to yield to this truth. But I pray that we would consider what it costs us if we don't. If there is no light in us, and even the light that we have will become darkness, that we're living out of, out of tune with the one who made us, who created us, to have perfect life. I pray that you would send your Holy Spirit now and bring conviction in this room to everyone within the sound of my voice that we would yield, that we would receive you, that we would walk in the light. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.